Hello, is this Steve Howe? Yes, it is. <laughs> now, where are we going? How do you want to start this? Are you, are you recording this, or are you just hoping to remember it? Recording, if that's all right with you. Good. Don't hit me. What, what are you going to ask me? Could you start off with the story of your The Les Paul, where you got it, why you bought it, etc.? I built it in 77 or 76. Yeah, I mean, I bought it from Gibson. I, I don't see that I bought this in a store. You know, I was getting guitars from Gibson. So, yeah, what a guitar. Well, I mean, I had it by the time I was doing going for the one you know so that kind of makes sense because it's all over that album as well it's all over double rondo that that's one of its main features i played that a lot in 70, in 1979 don't kill the whale on tomato but also on going for the one turn of the century i mean i saw this guitar and played it and immediately loved it so it was a direct purchase from gibson were you like part of their artist relations division at that time yeah, there was a great guy there called Pat, Pat Aldworth, his name is, and basically he was a great guy and made things happen, you know, if you wanted things and you wanted a visit. Was it a gift to you or did you still have to purchase it? I don't remember, but I usually paid, I mean, that guitar would have cost, you know, some money. It wasn't a, you know, a stock, you know, guitar they wanted to throw at me. That was a very detailed guitar. As you most probably know, it's got a lot of Luther's names to it. That's for sure. They outsourced the wooden parts, but you had Abe Wechter as the main luthier behind this project. But my next question is about the case. Is the current Oxblood Artist case the original one that you got with the guitar from Gibson? I mean, I hope it's still in the same case. It's a red sort of crocodile alligator looking case and inside it's pink. It'll fit in any of those poor case, but maybe not if it's still got those ginormous machine heads on the end. There's some guys that say that the TLPs only came in the Black Artist series cases, so it's nice to know that this one actually left the factory with the maroon. I mean, it was a red guitar and it was a red case. It was a perfect match. So now we know why you chose it, but how did you typically run this one? When we talk about that guitar, yeah, I mean, it sounds sounds really good, but of course, it wasn't just a guitar in an amp. <laughs> the interplay that those guitars have with effects is really quite wonderful. You know, if you've got a good guitar and you put it through a wah or something, it sounds really good. Mm -hmm. It emphasizes the sound, but that guitar was often used with an electroharmonics big muff. And there were about three models of them, and, you know, I had some early ones, which were really, really good. Basically, that guitar was, you know, pumped. It was always played through a Fender Dual Showman cabinet with two 15-inch speakers. So this guitar was not set up like a, a Les Paul and a Marshall. <laughs> this guitar was set up to play, like, a different kind of approach where I could get a clean, fairly clean sound, but with the press of a button, you know, I was off into heavy distortion. So, I, I you know... I mixed that in my style, but that guitar had both qualities. It could sound great on double rondo, and a clean sound, ding, 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 and all that stuff. But basically, it could also you know, just rock out with the big muff and the amplification, the whole driving, you know, plugging it in different amps and messing around with it, getting it. But particularly, on, I would say that on the, the sound on Turn of the Century Part 2, in other words, the electric half of Turn of the Century, is is just fantastic and what i do in my mind is i credit some of the things that i play on the guitar not to me but to the guitar so in other words that guitar is really the guitars are very important to me even though i can't keep them all and we're here talking about one that i used to own so you can see that i have a relationship with them because some of the things i did seem to only be possible on that guitar they were created on that guitar and they Therefore, they, they seem to be only possible on that guitar. I, I couldn't have just picked up the 175 and played it in the century. None of it would have been the same. I wouldn't have done anything the same. So the guitars are really very highly responsible for steering an artist. You know, I suppose if you're a great violinist and you've got a Stradivarius, you're always saying this. I'm playing a Stradivarius. Therefore, it's going to help me. And that's the same with a great Gibson or a great Fender or Great Martin, you know, you get one of these guitars and you can start to make music. Why did you choose to feature this particular guitar in the Heat of the Moment music video as well as Don't Kill the Whale? So yeah, it looked good. It looked really good. <laughs> yeah, I kind of figured that'd be the answer. Yeah, yeah. It was a nice moment to show it off, yeah. Well, you know, when you're miming, you can do what you like, really. Um, 
mainly it was the Gibson Les Paul Jr. all over that record, or, and the Telecaster for some single line. Whether I used it for the solo, I don't know at the end. Let's talk about the tuner tips that you put on the guitar. What's the story there? And do you happen to remember where the original pearl tip ones are? Right. I may have those. Uh, I mean, I haven't asked myself that question because nobody's asked me. But come to think of it, I dare say they might be a mystery pack of machine heads that I have. Do you want me to go and get my pearl buttons? I'll see if I've got them. So, so whereabouts are you based? I've forgotten. Ohio. Ohio. Oh, okay. That's what I meant. Yeah, Ohio. <laughs> yes, I know Ohio. But, oh, when I think of Ohio, you know, I think of a winter day when those traffic lights were swinging. You know, they're, they're, they're on the cables across the streets. <laughs> and I was in, you know, just in Ohio. <laughs> it kept happening. Every time I was in Ohio, it was raining. And the wind was blowing, and these traffic lights were moving. <laughs> and we have fixed traffic lights. You know, they're fixed to the post. But that's all good fun. It's all good fun. That's a good story. But your old guitar is serial number 26. They made a total of 77 of them. And just, oh, did they? Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. So just a little bit of fun information for you. The one that Les Paul ended up getting to keep was number 25. Yeah. So it's one number four-year-old one here. Oh, yeah. So yeah. That, that's kind of cool. Which is one, was it blonde? Yes. It had sold at an oh, auction wow. at his estate. Then I wow. kind of lost track of it from there. My ultimate collection goal here is I want to gather all the famous The Les Pauls. So that's number one. Yes. That's number 25. It's the current 26. And then Roger Fisher from Heart. He had one too. But apparently it's, oh. it's floating around out there. I think it'd be fun to get all four of those together. Those are the most historical oh, yeah. ones because Les Paul was supposed to get number one, but I guess there's a, a shipping snafu. It accidentally went to a store. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I bet he was delighted. Yeah. <laughs> with Gibson gave him so much trouble. Wow. You see, there's a great picture of me playing it with the orchestra. When you play with an orchestra, it, it gives you the shit. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> there's like 60 people or 30 or whatever it was here. <laughs> You're the soloist. That was a great touch. I really loved that guitar. And it sounds great on that double rondo and the... Uh, the gluey sound it has when I play Vivaldi on that dong, dan, 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 you know, most probably classical guitars hate me for playing it so slow, but I made it into an arpeggio as opposed to a sort of, dun, 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 you know, a bright piece. It became very kind of soulful. Yeah, and that picture of me with that crazy wire, yeah, I mean, there's a picture of me on the round stage where the, the telephone cable, that's an amazing picture. I tried to animate that once. But anyway, so the head on the picture, yeah, you've got these ginormous, like, I, imper they might be called Imperials, but I think that's, that's another model, but just ginormous heads. Has he still got those on? Yes, it, it still has it. So that's kind of where my question was going, is where did those metal buttons yeah. come from? Well, I was crazy about changing stuff. I don't know that it came, no, it came with the pearls, Correct. and I put those on, you know, I mean, I thought that was just like, that made the whole guitar work, even though it's fairly obscene <laughs> how big they are. I, I was looking that, through I your book, and, and I saw you at least put that exact same button style on one more. Yes, maybe one other guitar had them, but my most popular one are on the Les Paul Jr., like I've got on my Gretsch. I mean, I've got those on, on my Gibson Jumbo Country Western you know, that the other kind of staggery, country and western looking machine heads. But normally I use the, the regular Grovers, you know, with the rounded top. Only because I thought they were best, you know, that they work the best. The ones I was just talking about, the staggered three, three piece ones that are on the Les Paul Junior, they're real nice. But in fact, they're not great to use. But what I was trying to tell you was that behind is the barrel. So the barrel is the bit you can't see at the front, right? The barrel. Yes. So the barrels on the the three three piece one on the Les Paul Juniors, the V Les Paul, the barrels are much bigger than than a standard. Uh, and that was always convincing that it, that they would be better because they were bigger. They were more. But in fact, mainly they were just heavier. <laughs> so it actually counter put off balance guitars a little bit to have those on. Even that Les Paul that was so heavy, that most probably fairly balanced because it's got this enormous weight on, on the end of the neck. So uh, you don't happen to remember the brand or where you got those tuner tips from then? No, they're, they're Grovers, yeah. I mean, they're just a rarer kind of Grover machine head. Okay. Um, 
they're definitely Grovers. Oh. But yeah, you don't see those. I tell you who had them, Jan Ackerman. He had them on his Black Les Paul that he played. He played a Black Les Paul custom with them on. And, uh, I guess I spotted him playing them. They're the top model. My next question comes down to the TP6 tailpiece. One of the fine tuners on it is replaced. Is there a story there? I think it broke. I mean, the only reason we replace it is that it broke in some way, but I can't imagine why. Unless we were using them very you know, high out of it and it broke. But no, I, I can't make up a story, but I can imagine... It's hard to imagine, really, <laughs> it broke. But one of them broke and we replaced it, and uh, it's too long ago. don't remember, sorry. Did you find yourself using those fine tuners at all? Because I noticed the high E string has, like, all the plating worn off it. Like, maybe you would use it for right. that. That might have been the one I used the most. Fine tuners were, were really cool, but I didn't... I, to be honest, people don't use them very much, but because you're so used to tuning up with the machine head. And also, you've got your left hand free, and your right hand's got a plectrum in it, so you didn't often use them at all, really. On stage, you haven't really got time to do a whole bunch of tuning. In the studio... I mean, maybe you could fine-tune a little bit there. So I would say, tune the guitar a hundred times, I most probably only only use those ten times, you know what I mean? Gotcha. They weren't somewhere I always needed to go to. I mean, if the string went in pitch where you wanted it on the machine head, you didn't need to do any more. But if it was playing around, it, like a G string, an unwound G can, can get a bit gamey. Because it's looser, it's got a much wider, sharp on attack. So when you hit a G string that's say uh, a 16 or a 17, and it goes doing, you know, it's actually changing pitch. So that so the fine tuner helps you get in the middle somewhere. I was wondering if there were any stories behind like the more significant dings and dents on the guitar. Horror stories with guitars are, are things that I kind of suppress in my brain because if I think of a guitar, I think, oh, I had a horrible problem. But I don't like it too much, so I like to move on. I would have guaranteed that there are buckle scratches on the back that that was all but mostly the guitar didn't as far as i knew didn't suffer any major incidents but but that doesn't mean to say it didn't get dinged now and again because you know that could happen now let's talk about the back of the headstock when i was first inspecting this guitar i came upon a black light surprise your signature is on the back in invisible yeah. ink is, is that in, something you do for all your guitars or just special ones yeah in this period i i did invisible ink signatures on the back of all my guitars so they were detectable even though the person who stole it didn't realize yeah that was a little code i put on an, an sh in uh, invisible ink i think i should keep doing that you reminded me to do that because i, I had not done that for years and i i do have occasional new guitars that it's a, a great little easter egg yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna do that to all my new guitars thanks <laughs> <laughs> newer guitars rather so now as i understand it you sold this guitar somewhere in the 2000s to a guy named steve who lived in michigan does that sound right or was i fed a tale i saw plastic surgeon I knew. He was in Michigan, yeah. Yeah, I think you bought it from the guy I sold it to. Did you hand deliver it to him, or was that like a shipping type thing? Me doing shipping is, is blooming chaos, you know, because I've been very unlucky. Uh, Any time I put my name on something, it either gets lost or broken. I really don't honestly remember. If I sold it in 2000, it was most probably shipped. Uh, although, as I say, it, it, that became very precarious. And if possible, I would deliver guitars. That was so special, you know, I might have delivered it. But usually if I'm selling a guitar, I don't, I don't deliver. Either. Yep. So I can't really say for sure, I can't remember. What was the reason for selling? One day I, I added up my guitars and I had like, I think the maximum I, number I had was 175. And I thought, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> and that is just insane. So as the years go by, and by this 2000 period, I was starting to decide how to judge what to cut down and how to get rid of things and sell them and move them on. If I've had it for 20 years and played it, I might as well consider selling it. But that guitar was kind of different. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I took it on tour and I really got uncomfortable. It was just so heavy. It was just too heavy. It was like playing a, a twin neck all night or something. It just really wasn't comfortable. It was just too heavy for me. And that was the main reason. And I thought, really... That I had other Les Pauls anyway. I had a Les Paul Custom, you know, I had a Gold Top. I had 
so many Les Pauls. That was embarrassing, you know, because I wasn't a collector who wanted to get 10 of one model. You know, there are collectors who do that. You know, they'll buy every color, every variant. But I wasn't. I was a player collector. I wanted a guitar that would be good. So I'm surprised I sold it, really. Later on, I sort of thought to myself that... There's only a couple of guitars I've ever sold and thought, well, maybe I shouldn't have really sold that because it was just that good. I should have just sat down and played it. It is surprisingly good sounding. I mean, I don't know that it still will sound that good because yeah, I got the guitar and I played it a lot and that makes it live. So if the guitar's been dormant for a long time, you know, it's got to be renovated. You know, it's got to be set up again. It's got to be, every fret has to be shined. You know, I have a process with a guitar that's been neglected. We have to go through everything. And usually when it comes out of that, it's just amazing. Then it's been refreshed and cleaned up. In hindsight, you often question all sales, you know, whether you, I should have just lived with 175 guitars. But no, I didn't want to do that. And I've still got 70, and yet I've recently sold a whole bunch. <laughs> Even though I try, you know, I still get more. But um, that's another story. I remember a couple of years ago on Reverb, I kept seeing a couple of other of, you know, ex Steve Howe guitars show up. Is that usually how you yeah. sell your guitars? You just consign them at a shop? Different times I have done things myself. I always used American Contact. But, uh, yeah, I've done that a lot with Rudy's friends out there. But, but basically, many years ago, I said that, you know, I'll only work with this guy, Justin Harrison. So he, he runs a bit, I think it's Hank's Guitars, and they're under various names. But, yeah, I mean, you know, we do the deal and he does the thing. But sometimes they go on reverb. That's usually uh, if they're slow movers because he's got his own people. The reason I do it like this is that I'm not trying to make a big song and dance with it. You know, it's not headline news. Steve Howe selling his guitars. Yeah. It's nothing, it's nothing like that at all. This is just a process of streamlining my collection so i don't i don't want publicity i want it to be just just people who really appreciate these kind of guitars because they're not cheap but did you get my message about the book you're featured in a book called the tomato story because i thought that was quite nice i mean it, it was a coincidence because somebody uh, that was actually our singer john davison i got together with him and he gave me uh, that book called the tomato story and at first I thought, oh, a whole book about Tomato, <laughs> one of my least favorite albums. So, well, it's quite interesting how much, you know, he talks about, you know, you getting the guitar and this and that. I mean, I'm not going to work through it and tell them if they're right or wrong all the time, but basically they got about 90% of it right. So, anyway. Going through your book, I notice you have, like, some custom guitars. Did Gibson ever consider a signature model with you? The reissue of the 175, which was a very long and painful process, was supposed to be that. But since they bothered to do it, they did no promotion, and hardly anybody knew that there was actually a guitar out there called a, a Steve Howe ES-175D. They made little advertising about it, and every now and again they come back to me and swoon and say, oh, Steve, I'm in their gallery of great guitarists, and yet they do, <laughs> as Steve laughs, uh, you know, they kind of forget about me too. But um, so that was the closest it got. Now, the guitar that I mentioned that, that was stolen at Detroit Airport mm -hmm. was really going to be the first custom guitar. They, did, they made me that country and western model uh, country guitar with my name up the fingerboard. That was really the only other one that I've still got. They, they made me other guitars and I sent them back. I sent them back. A, so that's the closest it ever got to a... Uh, a signature model. So besides that natural blonde one that got stolen, the Steve Howe ES-175D with the triple humbuckers and Super 400 headstock, that was meant to be like a prototype signature model back in the late 70s and not just something you had custom ordered for you? Yeah, okay, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, yeah, below it, you see the, 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 the custom guitar that was stolen. And uh, what they sent me next time, they said, sorry, we can't do a blonde, we don't have the wood, here it is. And they kind of sent it, sent them, something to me. That, that, has, that picture actually hasn't got the artist model tailpiece that I, that I had with it. I used it a bit and it was fun, but kind of went a bit nowhere, that, that project. Uh, yeah, the idea was that it was a 175, but it, I could get a Switchmaster sound out of it with the middle pickup and play things like, you know, long distance run around things on, on a 175. But 
that only went so far. One didn't realise at the time how much Gibson sound and the pickups were changing. Later in the 2000s was that they released the Steve Howe 175, and that was just a, a retro of, it was a reissue of the, uh, we tried to get it as close to a 64 guitar. Uh, in some ways it failed miserably, and in other ways it was, it was fairly close. I mean, I commend everybody that tried to do it, but they... They only got behind it to, to half a degree, not a whole degree. I got paid, you know, I got, I got a couple of those guitars every year, in fact, free, um, which I didn't really want, but um, they <laughs> kept coming. <laughs> For many years, I got two on lines every year. I used to ship them to other people. I gave one to Alison Krauss. Uh, for her son, and you know, I did things like that. I just said, Well, I don't need two more ones to arrive. Thank you very much. It could have been much more because I'm really own one of the only sort of in the last 50 years call that current artist who plays 175 to the degree that I did, you know, or do still. But all attempts to do anything more, I mean, I have two 64 175s, you know, the one you see in the book obviously stays, stays in my studio all the time. Unless I play it in the UK, uh, or I'm possibly tempted to play it in Europe by driving. It's done a lot of road work, and it's it's now replaced by another 64 that I like. You know, it's pretty good. It's maybe not as good as this one, but there you are. <laughs> if Gibson approached you today, would you be interested in doing another signature model? Because ever since they changed ownership in 2019, they've been trying to patch past relationships where they couldn't necessarily create the guitar that they were after or they did them dirty or something. Even if they did, um, I mean, I've done a couple of Martin guitars, you know, and and that's been the early R18 Steve Howe and the MC38 Steve Howe. And they've been really successful for me because... Well, I play the 38 all the time. That, that's my go-to acoustic, and uh, so it's marvellous. It depends what they come to me with, if they got any ideas or they're looking for my ideas. I'm very impressed that after seeing videos of Ted Atkins in the later years of his life playing at Gibson, Tennessee, and I went out and got one. It's a 1997 one, and it's orange, and it's just beautiful. It plays remarkably well, and it sounds almost like it does when Chet playing them. So they've got a lovely, clear sound that responds. And I've been recording. I just got it in October. I was just talking like if they approached you to do like an ES-175 reissue and put your name on it. That, that's that's kind of what I was getting at. Not necessarily a brand new well, model. You know, but the trouble is, if it doesn't play as well, then it's very hard to beat my 64, you know, my original. Nowadays, is they will take yeah. your original... And they'll, like, do X-ray and CT scans to, like, completely reproduce it. I've heard this story. This story came to me some years ago where they said that's exactly what, what, what they wanted to do. And I said, that's exactly fine with me. Go ahead. And nothing happened. You know, so, gotcha. <laughs> so basically, I, I have been around the roundabout a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I think that answers that question. So my next one, yeah, well, yeah. what is the significance of the double pick guard to you? I got the artist, the one that you see on 18, you know, the, the sunburst. I got that, and I had it for a couple of years. It blew me away. I didn't know how I was going to control myself on this guitar. It was so, you know, I had this limiter in it, and, you know, I was just imagining how to use this guitar. And, of course, Asia came along, and this is a great guitar to play everything I do with Asia on stage. It wasn't what I used in the recording studio, but, you know, on stage it was it covered all the ground. So... I'd always thought that double clutch plates would look really cool, and I always wondered why people didn't do it, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, while I was playing around with this guitar and, and being quite close with Gibson, maybe even before Asia started, um, I said, can you do me the opposite pick card? They said, oh, sure. Of course, they send it. It's perfect. <laughs> it fits on, bang. And then when I put that on, I thought, that's fantastic, the symmetry. Now I've got, like, incredible symmetry around me. All the artists I had at that period um, had double scratch, double scratch plates. Very, well, not really extravagant, but, but, of course, none of the ones I had after that. The black one was quite good. I had four in all. And the black one, that did rock. When I played that, it, it did scream a bit, and it was rocky. But the blonde one and the sunburst didn't. 
they were muted, they were dull, they were unexciting to play. It was lovely having so many and having them at different pitches and reserves. I mean, I, I was in an element where this was the only guitar I played. I so think so they didn't wise, ship from the factory with them? They sent it to you to put no. on afterward? Well, the blonde one I custom ordered, so I custom ordered it with, with it. Two, two scratch plays. So they knew that was off and running. Uh, but the black one I just bought stock and the um, the sunburst, I've had two sunbursts actually, uh, one in those days and then, <laughs> do you know, crazy story happened. It was crazy because I sold those three guitars, the blonde, the black and the sunburst. And then when I went back with Asia, I suddenly realized, oh, <laughs> do you know what? <laughs> I've only got one artist, and I'm going on tour, and I've got what, one guitar. And we say, Baker String, I need the backup. So I bought another sun press. Oh, dear. Which I don't, I didn't keep, because it was, it just couldn't, we couldn't get it up and running. Charles are great, they just are always there. You know, maintenance is really important, mm -hmm. good strings. But if the guitar's got the, the, the balls, if you like, to be really screamy and great, then... It will do that, but other guitars won't. You know, they, they won't get over the hump. They don't have enough, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's about playing them, setting them up. It's about playing them mainly. So the more that you play them, the better they get. So you can't play all of them all the time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they get redundant. Do you currently still own any of those ES artist guitars, or have they all moved on? No, I'll never sell the, the Sunburst. No, I just kept the Sunburst. That's alive and well. And it's on a new record I'm releasing, possibly this year. It's going to be the, one of the featured records. And that's because I had it renovated. And basically, it, uh, it plays like a Steinway piano. So w when you say renovated, is it just like a setup, or did they mess with the Moog electronics? Well, it's a massive setup. You know, it's a massive cleanup. It's looking at every aspect of the guitar to make it better. You know, if the guitar's been left a bit redundant, then it needs to be brought up to playing level. And playing level means it's perfect. Everything's perfect. The intonation, all the frets are shined, the woods oiled a little bit on the fingerboard. You know, it's all cleaned up. Machine heads are checked. You know, if they're not working right, we fix them. Everything is right. The electronics are then checked and made sure there's, so there's no ifs and buts about a guitar. And, you know, if it lets you down on stage, then <laughs> you hate it. <laughs> you know, it's like, you let me down. Don't do that. So, you know, guitars have to be really rigidly reliable. Some people say these artist guitars sounded better when they were new, and it's because, like, the caps dry out in the Moog boards. I was curious if uh, you ever noticed it started to sound different than when you'd first gotten it. Um, well, when I first got it, I didn't really know what to do with it, so I only used the limiter. Well, I mean, mainly that's the only one I use. I had to get it adjusted inside. There was an adjustment you could make, because if when you press the switch, the guitar leaps in volume, <laughs> You know, by 10 dB, you kind of like, you're out the game, you know, you're not, nobody's going to like it. That limiting had to be brought down to controllable level. Um, yeah, those guitars, you don't need the switches. It's already active, you know, so the guitar is active. And the pots up and down is really great, you know, less treble or more treble, less bass or more bass. That, that's a really good feature. You can really, in the studio, customize the sound where you want it. But as far as, um, so it has its own tone, you know, so it's already got a sound. So the switches aren't that useful, only because you don't really need them often. Um, but the limiting is the best effect. And the three the three controls is really nice in the switch. You know, I mean, I think it's a very good design. It's Moog, wasn't it? But Moog did it. You're saying you don't find yourself using the switches all the time. It's more so you, you just like the, huh. the particular pickups that they were using in those. It just yeah. worked for you. That, that's why you like it. very important. Yeah, but I would go back on myself and say that in the Asia days, when it was really put into work, I mean, it was doing all the Asia tours and then... A bit more. I mean, that didn't last forever. But that was an intense time where I was using the switches. But So mainly the limiter for guitar solos. So when I came to do a break, I had my pedal board, you know, the old analog pedal boards and things, and bang, I'd go, you know, press that switch. <laughs> <laughs> the guitar would really scream out. Well, we're going back to page 33, your whole quadraphonic oh, Les Paul custom. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the thought process behind that one and whatever became of it. It 
came with two pickups. I took them out. I put four pickups in. I think Sam Lee did this. We put four pickups in the middle. I mean, totally crazy idea. They just fitted. It seemed like, well, that's made made to be. So the idea was really a quadraphonic guitar, you know, because quadraphonics was big. So I thought, yeah, a pickup in each speaker, that would be cool. But what we did was we put the tone where the switch used to be and they were the controls. So I don't know if we had any super plug in it, but basically the long story is that that was how I played it on Tomato album, I think. And, you know, I, I quite like the guitar. I thought the fingerboard, at first I thought the fingerboard was the best thing I'd ever felt in my life. But then I realized I, I didn't really, I wasn't really going to be constantly on the, on the Les Paul. I didn't. I wasn't familiar with the solid quality sound of it, and I liked some, you know, 335s and 175, so I, I never went totally over to Les Paul as much as I did on Tomato. So this guitar then, what happened was, in the 2000s, I got together with Hugh Manson, and I said to him, you know, this I can't live with any longer, it's got to go back. So he built the guitar back to, more or less invisibly, back to everything it had. It had two pickups, it had the scratch play, had the switch, and it had uh, volume and tones. So we put it back, and then I sold it, because I didn't like the guitar at all. Um, I used it on Fly From Here somewhere, and I used it on a few other places, but it's not a Les Paul of choice for me. I, I, I moved on that one. I took off the <laughs> Les Paul's personal signature trustwork cover. That's, that's a lovely thing. I love that. Nice little sentimental value there. So it was yeah. basically just a... An idea that you wanted to try, but ultimately maybe not the best. But it sure does yeah. look cool. I, I've always wanted to just to throw a whole it, bunch it, of pickups in a custom too. <laughs> I've still got the four pickups. If anybody wants to buy them, the four pickups are still in place as a unit with with the, with the blonde sidings. You know, I don't know what to do with it. But if somebody wants to do the same thing. You know, they can come to me and they can use it. You'll have <laughs> to let me know how much you want for that. I think that would be cool just to, you know, like display next to the V Les Paul or, you know, mock up another guitar like it. <laughs> okay, be cool. I'll think about it. Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to move on. Them. You were pretty adaptive to Gibson's new technologies, like the Roland Ready Les Paul Studio that you've used. But did Gibson ever contact you about their Photon series? It was this weird guitar with no traditional pickups, just the MIDI system. And had a Kaler on it. Okay, so we're talking about the guitar synth model, the, the 85 Roland, yeah? Or are you saying they brought out a later one with no pickups? In about 1988, they were prototyping something called the Photon that had no pickups. I was curious if they ever like got you a prototype or if you ever tried it or had heard of it. The name sounds a bit familiar and the story sounds a bit familiar, but no, I don't think it did. But I was the guy to call when you had a synth, you know, and that's how I ended up buying a step and having all the Roland guitar synths right from the blue one and then you know the 700 and, and I love them yeah I mean I love playing around with it I love having a guitar with another sound I don't do it very often anymore and I'm surprised but I've, I'm tempted it is I've got all the stuff and that Roland has been really durable um, it did let me down a little bit last time I took it out last tour a couple of nights it started not the sound, so we haven't got to the bottom of it. We've discarded it, so that guitar will be kind of out of action for a while because it, you know, it's been like a naughty boy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's uh, and so it will come back to it and say, okay, well, what the hell happened? You know? But it's been very durable, very good on the road generally. It's got those fun machine heads where they come out. You know, when you can open each individual machine head, and it's got a little turner on it. It does ring a bell. Now you've mentioned it, yeah, but when Gibson went experimental, I mean, fortunately, they did a lot of that in the early years, and that's why you've got many things that we take for granted. But they were less successful, you know, like when they did the, the digital guitar, don't go there, you know. just The robot oh. Firebird X type stuff? The guitar that tuned itself and also had digital inputs. You could plug it straight into digital machines. Mm. But, you know, the whole thing just kind of fell flat on its, on its face. No, they sent me one. I sent it back. I said, no, there's just, just, there's just nothing here. <laughs> it's not working. So uh, I'm very sensitive about guitars. You know, I'm just looking at my Les Paul Jr. You know, that guitar can play anything, anything at all on. It's got one pickup. It's got two knobs, six strings, 
and it's actually like a Telecaster is, but it's only got one pickup, and even though it's very, very durable, you know, with that tone control. Was it mainly the robot tuners that turned you off, or the actual tones of the robot guitars? I didn't like the sound of them. Okay. No, no, I plugged them in something, and we said, oh, it's got to go in this box, and we went, oh, dear. So basically giving you a guitar, no matter if it's digital or not, gotcha. and it doesn't empathize or move the air or do something. You know, it's hard to describe what I like about a guitar, but that isn't. They didn't have it. <laughs> it wasn't available. I think we already kind of answered this one. What does your guitar collection look like right now? You said about 70-ish guitars. Yeah, that's counting a ukulele. You know, the whole instrument line yeah, is about 70 pieces, but I think there's... 17 Gibsons and 7 Martins, about 7 Fenders, and it kind of builds up and then a couple of jazz guitars and stuff, you know, and antiques, I've got a lovely collection of lyre guitars. So basically, it's just the things I like, more or less getting smaller and smaller, I hope. Your Line 6 Very Axe. Somebody was asking, yeah. are you still mainly using that, or are you going back to, you know, more so having multiple guitars on stage? I won't stop having multiple guitars, but the Very Axe covers at least two or three guitars that I need in one. If I need an acoustic within an electric song, then I use that. And if I need a sitar guitar, or I need anything that's kind of different from what I'd like to use. So mainly I move between those things. So the very X will keep having a place in the set, but I'll still have, you know, a strap for one song or I'll have the artist or one of two those 175s. So yeah, I'll still be moving around guitars because they accumulate, like the Portuguese guitar, then the Martin, and then the steel guitar. So the whole thing is that merry-go-round, it's usually about eight guitars, including the Variax. Do you have a preferred gauge and brand of strings? I use the Dario, and basically gauges are fairly unique to each guitar. You know, so like a steel guitar will have really heavy strings on it, so I can hit the top string and cripple under my my pressure but on another guitar yeah i'll uh, on a strap i'll need maybe a 10 on the top but you know i still use 50 40 and 28 quite often as my bottom four three strings 28 26 on the d string and then 40 and 50 on the bottom so i like something quite quite firm but on the top, that's where it changes a little bit. Sometimes around third on some three three fives or three four fives, but other times I'll use. You know, as I say, it varies on the top whether it's between usually eleven, twelve, and just occasionally it'll slip to thirteen on the top if I'm really picking a lot on on an acoustic guitar. But I like I prefer twelve. That's the less Paul, you would regularly be running somewhere around eleven gauge strings. Then is that accurate? Yeah, eleven to fifty. 17, 28, 40, 50, something like that. It's a kind of funny sort of structure, but it's very tight in some areas and a little looser in others. Can you talk a little bit about your classical guitar upbringing and how it later influenced you? I love classical guitar. I'm 20 years old, so I'm here in like Julian Bream or something. I'm thinking, no, this is, this is sheer magic. So I love classical music. It's, a, it's another way of listening to music, really, <laughs> if it isn't like the kind of stuff we, we've generally been talking about uh, previously. So, yeah, but the classical guitar is very, very important pretty early on with Segovia. I started collecting his records, and then Julian Bream, and then John Williams. And Flavio Sala is a friend of mine who's a, a fairly young guitarist who's brilliant from Italy. So I've always got an ear for classical guitar. I've always had it, you know, I always love it. I always use it, I always incorporate it in any album I'm doing. There'll be some Spanish guitar, in fact, some of them more than others. Out of your entire catalog, is there a particular guitar solo of yours that's like your number one favorite? <laughs> I, I'm not, I don't know if I can do favorites like that. Sure, I like Siberian Couture, the end, you know, except I wish I'd taken out the other guitars that are going... I wish I'd taken those out because in a way they're very distracting. To, to what I'm actually doing. I've recorded like the classic sort of guitar solos like in, you know, I've seen a good people that that's a kind of classic rock solo, you know, Starship, Starship Trooper. But a lot of that stuff, like Coach of the Edge, is really very exciting introduction. So I, I've done a lot of stuff. Sometimes I think that the one is that the one I can never hear again was a guitar solo I did on, a, on an Asia song called uh, Over and Over. 
It did eventually get re-recorded, and I did actually try to reproduce the solo, but what happened was I was in a townhouse, and I'd uh, done this great solo, and I just knocked myself, knocked my socks off, but this solo was so good. You know what happened the next day? We played it, and it had been erased or something. Oh, no. <laughs> it wasn't there. I was like, give me a effing break. <laughs> you mean that, that solo's not there? The one I spent three hours on, you know, it's not there, no. Song, your favorite solo never made it to <laughs> public ears. Yeah, in a way, I am. But yeah, there are <laughs> things I like. I can't really pick out one in particular. But listen, we've been talking so long. I've got to stop. It's been very nice, yeah. Austin. Goodbye. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Bye. It's been fun. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. For now.